Our man Phil Murphy from ESPN joins us. Happy New Year. Welcome back to the show, mate. Uh, Happy New Year to you all as well. I hope uh, the southern summer is treating you better than the northern winter treats us. (laughs) Well, look, I experienced a wee bit of it there um, in December, and it's a kind of cold, Phil. Look, you know, we we have snow in, in right at the very south of our of our country here. You've been to Australia. They get a little bit on their ski fields. But, look, we just don't have that bone-chilling cold that you get up on the East Coast. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a different level here. And, I mean, I don't know if you can really appreciate it watching American sport most times. I mean, some games, if there's snow on or you see wind howling, you can – kind of get a feel for it but until you've been there in person that that rite of passage you really don't appreciate the challenge for these uh these you know at least the gridiron players to to try to endure for for the part of their season that's the most important uh it is a divisional round this weekend one quick question and when you're on the sideline for these games look because uh you know at the at the buffalo bills game i was layered up man i had under shorts i had shorts over the under shorts i had shorty shorts over the short shorts what are you wearing under that suit is is, is that just is that just a shirt strides and a jacket or, or what oh no 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 i uh i definitely have some um some thin thermals, you know, some, some, I, I, I fancy myself a, a, a decent skier. So I have some pretty good skiing gear. So I find some, uh, some thin thermals that, you know, still allow me to wear the suit. And then, uh, I, for whatever reason, it's, it's proven fashionable to have a scarf kind of tucked into the suit as well. And then gloves, hand warmers. And I will say to the credit of the NFL players on the sidelines, they can see us. They're suffering. We're not going around and running around and getting our body temperatures up. We're pretty cold for the duration. So typically they have heaters, uh, like these space heaters on the sidelines. The players will invite us over to stand there, you know, during stoppages and play just to get a little respite of of warmth. So that's, I I mean, I I can go down a list of guys from each team who, you know, generally will say, hey, come over here, stand here, get warm, because, uh, man, we need it. And as as you know, it gets really cold. And and being on the field, you don't have the benefit of, you know, fans around you, collective body heat. It is just you and the elements. And then having to learn, you know, again, speak to camera with some kind of aptitude. Well, yeah, well, brilliant. Absolutely. That is so cool to hear. All right, divisional round this weekend, four matches. Does it come down to who's the best QB or does it come down to who's the best team? Yeah, I, many years I would have said quarterback um, because we have seen typically the best quarterback get through. It's, it's, it's on which Tom Brady built his legacy uh, but this season, I don't know if that's the case. Um, you, you look at a team like the San Francisco 49ers, who are just so, so complete. Uh, defensively, they have per- perhaps the best defense in the NFL. And then their collection of stars at each of the skill positions offensively, from Christian McCaffrey to Debo Samuel, the wide receiver, to George Kittle, the tight end. Brock Purdy has been very serviceable as the third-string quarterback for the 49ers, but no one would make the case that he's the best quarterback remaining though San Francisco's a team a lot of people are tipping to make a deep run and, and all things equal. I, I see a lot of, uh, of rationale in that. But again, it, it, it is a quarterback-driven league, and if you were to tell me that Dak Prescott is going to throw for 400 yards this weekend yes. in San Francisco, well, then I like Dallas's chances flat out. So it, the, the how good is your good, a quarterback finding his true ceiling can always elevate a team beyond what the other side is doing. But but just across the board, outside of those outlier performances, I, I think depth of team matters more now than ever. It's always the personality of the quarterback, isn't it? I mean, that's where the headlines are. And when we start, this is Sunday our time, Saturday your time, of course, Jags versus KC. you got Trevor Lawrence, the number one pick, up against another number one pick, but a very proven man in Patrick Mahomes. Uh, then we've got the Giants and a quarterback who's proven a lot of people wrong this year against Jalen Hurts and the injuries that he's had. Fat, fascinating first day's matchup. It is, and I will say, I think the viewing window is actually more convenient in New Zealand than it is here in the United States because you know the commercial demand for these games is so extensive. These these games go three and a half, sometimes all, close to four hours if it's high scoring. And you're thinking, what for in New Zealand? It's a 10 a.m. kickoff on Sunday for the first game. That's brilliant yeah. for me. The latter game could be running up past midnight. You know, I have a two-year-old daughter. That's, that's hard for me to stay awake, no matter how compelling the game might be. But that said, the games are pretty compelling. Uh, you have a, a quarterback in Jalen Hurts who has grown up before our eyes and carried Philadelphia to the number one seed. There are questions about his fitness. The Eagles facing a very familiar foe in the Giants, a team that they've beaten twice, a team that last year had arguably the worst offense in the NFL. And then here they are. Daniel Jones has made himself tens of millions of dollars with his performance, his contracts up at year's end, as is running back Saquon Barkley. 
and then, you know, down the line, you, you go to a Patrick Mahomes. What can he continue to elevate his game? He's, he's seen what teams have thrown at him in, in terms of defensive schemes. And though his numbers may not be quite to the level they were of his MVP season, he is likely to win the MVP again this year. And he's played against a lot more complex coverages. And he lost Tyreek Hill. So you could make the argument that his stats may have suffered, but he could be the better player. Is he starting to write himself a, a, a legacy that will stand among the all-time greats? Or will will he in Kansas City fall victim to a, a, a Jacksonville side that seems to be peaking at the right time? This is a team that was 4-7 and seven in a playoff afterthought. And then they just decided they, they weren't keen on losing again. And here they are playing with house money in Kansas City. It, it, we, we do make the argument this is the best weekend of NFL games. It's, it's not the deepest because there are only four of them. But it, it is the last eight. There are four viewing windows. It takes up our entire weekend here stateside and any one of these teams if they get hot all it takes is three consecutive wins and they're Super Bowl champions. Phil Murphy is with us ESPN uh, we're watching two or three weeks ago now absolutely riveted the day the Bengals and the Bills played that was in Cincinnati and uh, the young man Hamlin of course collapsing on the field uh, just the absolute shock horror of that uh, a couple of questions about this. The rematch now, but this is obviously in Buffalo. And look, is there is there any overwhelming empathy or sympathy amongst neutral fans still for Buffalo because of this? Or, or because Hamlin is now up and walking around and he seems that he's going to be okay. We don't know if he'll play again, of course, but thank, thank, thank goodness he's going to be. It seems okay. Does that mean that you're kind of, your normal fan goes back to hating the Bills if they hated the Bills like they always hated the Bills? No, I mean, the Bills have kind of a unique history in that they've made it to the Super Bowl four times in four consecutive years. They're the first team to do that and lose all four times, that in the early 90s. So they have kind of, a, for lack of a better term, and I mean no disrespect, a lovable loser label yeah, to yeah, them. Nobody's yeah. really been intimidated by the Buffalo Bills. And now they have a team that's very exciting to watch. Very, They have playmakers on both sides of the ball. They have the number two scoring offense and a number two scoring defense in the entire NFL. A lot of neutrals would say, all right, you know, I'd be keen to see, you know, Buffalo win, if, if, unless it's a rival side. Uh, if you don't have, a, a, you know, a, a team in the race and, and a, a rival against whom to root, I, I see a lot of neutrals supporting Buffalo. That was prior to the DeMar Hamlin uh, scare on the sideline. Then you saw the nature of, of the Bills support club. They, they, they call themselves the Bills Mafia, raising millions of dollars for DeMar Hamlin's charity while he was injured and, and, and recovering, and then a bunch of neutral fans did as well. Although, thankfully, the concern for Hamlin has abated because it does seem that whether or not he has any playing days left in him, his, his health is intact. He's, he's back at the team facility daily, you know, visiting teammates, chatting to them. It seems as though his life at, at some point in the not-too-distant future, uh, there's a lot of reason for optimism that he will return to a level of normalcy, normalcy if not the elite fitness he once had. But even, even without that immediate concern for his well-being, I think still people could see it as a, something of a fairy tale storybook ending if, if the Bills were to go on to win their first Super Bowl with what happened. And I will say, you know, although it is the same opponent they're seeing in Week 17, the Bengals could not have handled that situation better from stadium logistics to – um, you know, crowd respect of what was going on in the field to the C city of Cincinnati embracing Hamlin in the aftermath and making, uh, you know, makeshift uh, placards and monuments and, and encouragement and sending him, you know, local elementary school students, sending him uh, get wealth cards. It really has, I think, forever united these, these teams. And while it will be a high level game, it's, it's cool that you get this high level, high stakes game where there's no real animosity between the teams. Yeah, good it will be an intense cool. game, don't mm. get me wrong. Yeah. But these teams have gained a lot, had a lot of respect for each other, and I, it really is the perfect opponent for this stage. All right, Phil, then. Okay, neck out time, man. Here we go. And look, I mean, and I've also got to say that uh, there is. There is still lingering bitterness on my side when your team, your commanders, finish on the five hundred at eight eight and one. But that last one's a garbage game. I mean, it just it, it just leaves a sour taste, man. I was there when we lost to the Giants at home, where the umpire said twice to Terry, "You're okay, you're okay," and then when the play started, he flagged him and said, "You're out of position, mate." And so there is still not anger that subsides, but there is bitterness, Phil. Oh, I understand it, and the Washington team. I mean, it's. They, they took a stride in the right direction this year. Terry McLaurin has every bit the, the makings of a superstar. They have the hardest question to answer in the NFL. You, you talk about the quarterbacks. Mm. They need to decide what they're doing at the quarterback position. If they're going to, with one game of sample size, 
stay with Sam Howell or in a draft with a few quarterbacks available, but ones for which Washington would need to pay something of a price to move up and get, will they make a move on one of these quarterbacks in the NFL draft coming up in April and May? Or will they pursue one of the offseason free agent quarterbacks? We saw that didn't exactly go great with no. Carson Wentz last offseason. Now you have a Derek Carr on the market. You have some other guys who may be coming available. I mean, Lamar Jackson's contract remains undecided. He's a free agent to be from Baltimore. So th- there, there's no clear direction there. I think that is priority one, two, and three for your commanders in the offseason. Because as we can see, in the NFC half of the playoff picture, the last four they have all three of their division yeah. opponents. So it, yeah. it, it will be a tall task for Washington to climb that ladder in that division, and they have to sort out the quarterback position first, second, and third priority. All right, then, very quickly, one, two, three, four. Who we got, Jags, KC? Uh, KC. Giants, Eagles. Man, I want I wanted to do the trendy pick. The, the Giants were so, so impressive last week. If, you are, uh, if you're somebody who's keen for a punt, I would take the Giants in the points, but I think the Eagles, with their depth, they find a way in a very close game. Bengals, Bills. I think the, I think the fairy tale, the storybook continues. The Bengals have a lot of injuries on their offensive line. I think they get, the, the Bills' front seven gives Joe Burrow problems. I think Joe Burrow gets sacked five to six times in the game, and I think the Bills keep marching on. And Cowboys 49 is storied fixture this one. Yeah, they've met, what, four, five times in NFC Championship games. They've met eight times in the playoffs. Very familiar opponents. Dallas' offense can be incendiary at times. I just think schematically San Francisco is going to be a step ahead. So I, uh, I like San Francisco at home, and, and we really see uh, what Brock Purdy has in an NFC Championship game. So I'm going four favorites. I know it's not you know the most uh, out there on a limb, but – there's a reason those casinos are so large. I think the, the lines are set right. I think, I think the 49ers get it done.